My name is Alex Dorch, and I'm an Ansible Solution Specialist, and I'm going to be walking through using OpenShift Dev Spaces as an Ansible development environment. So what is OpenShift Dev Spaces? So OpenShift Dev Spaces is essentially a way to provide consistent environments out to different developers. This is obviously running, in my case, in OpenShift, and it's leveraging my execution environment as that development space. So this means I can spin up user environments on demand. They don't always need to be running. I can spin them up and spin them down, and it will pull directly from that repository at runtime. Because of the fact that I'm using my execution environment as the terminal image, all the syntax highlighting and autocomplete from my EE, so any custom collections that I have, any additional collections outside of that base EE are all included. And I can just use Ansible Playbook to run the jobs because all of the development is happening inside the execution environment. I don't need to run Ansible Navigator and spin up an EE because I'm already inside that EE. There were a few steps that I need to do in order to have my execution environment work with OpenShift Dev Spaces to make sure Ansible Lint had the correct permissions and also to have Bash set up properly so I had the right colorization that I like to use. And then once that's done, I've got that pushed into a repository, I can just add a dev file to any repository in my GitHub and I'm able to very quickly spin things up. So first I'll walk through what modification I had to make to my execution environment, and then I'll show how simple that dev file can be. So as I mentioned, a base execution environment won't work with OpenShift dev spaces. It needs some additional permissions in order for Ansible Lint to work. And also I like to have a nice colorized bash terminal prompt. So I wanted to add that in as well. So I created two different ways to do this. One, if you've got an existing execution environment and one, if you're creating a new one to have this capability built in. So let's first go, if I have an existing execution environment, you can use this container file that I've already developed. And all you'd have to do is change this base image to be one that you have. And then all it does is go through the process of creating the different shell prompts that I want available, as well as my specific bash terminal. So it's got the colorization that I want. I like to give it a nice container name. So it actually has some sort of name in the terminal prompt. And then I'm going through and setting those file permissions. So everything works properly. OpenShift Dev Spaces has a random user ID with a GID of zero. So I'm making sure that the user will have the necessary permissions to run everything that Ansible requires. That's really what this step is doing. So you can obviously modify the bash RC to be whatever particular colorization or terminal prompts that you want, as well as the specific shells that you want. So if you use tmux or something like that, I could have that capability built in as well. So once I've created this container file, I can just run podman build create the image that I want, tag it, whatever name I want, and then push that to a container registry. So once that's done, I then just need a dev file.yaml. Really what this is designed for is this is how OpenShift Dev Spaces knows what to create. So this is basically defining what image to use, obviously the different memory limits, and what I want it to be named. So the specific user knows, here's what the expectation is from that side. I can do this as well in the execution environment build process by adding it into my execution environment.yaml. So if you've automated your build process like I have, you can just modify the build process and the build steps. So make sure the build files adds in that bash RC and that shells capability. Make sure that you also then copy those files in. Do the same part where you're adding the export. So it's got a container name and then set up the file permissions. And then just make sure as part of your build process, you are adding those two files into the shells and bash RC. If you're doing this all from the command line, just make sure you add into your prepend or append final step that copy and those run commands. So to make sure that the necessary permissions and bash are set for all the different file capabilities. It really does simplify the process a lot if I do this during the execution environment build. So I'd recommend that unless you have existing execution environments that you want to develop off of. And then again, I can create another dev file for this particular service now project, and I just give it a different metadata name. And then I just need to make sure this image is exactly what my modified EE is. So in my case, I pushed it to quay.io. So you can see my execution environment modification lives in here. And all I need to do is make sure that that dev file.yaml is at the root of my directory. So in this case, Ansible service now, dev file.yaml, and I can copy and paste this into every single repository that exists in my environment. So it streamlines that capability. So once I create that modified execution environment, all I need to do is give users access to it. So in theory, I only need to do that execution environment build once, and then each user just needs to use dev spaces to have that capability. 
I'm gonna use the Red Hat Developer Sandbox, but I could also use OpenShift Dev Spaces in my OpenShift environment, whether it's on-prem, whether it's in the cloud, because this is what's easiest and available to me. So I'm going to launch that. And then all I'm going to do is use my GitHub repository. If you notice, there is a sample that exists for Ansible. The problem with this is only has Ansible Core, Ansible Lint, and Ansible Molecule, not the additional collections that I have. So I do wanna use my execution environment because I need access to the Azure collections, the containers.podman collections, all of those. So all I need to do is point to my GitHub URL. In this case, I'm gonna use that service now one that I showed before. And now it's gonna go through the process of pulling in that repo, checking to see that a dev file exists, and then it's gonna spin up that workspace and have everything up and running for me. So it really simplifies a lot of the process for an end user. And then once it's actually done pulling everything in and the workspace is up, it'll open that IDE again in my web browser and I'll be able to jump right into it without really going into too much effort. So this is gonna look just like Code Ready Workspace or VS Code on your laptop, but this conveniently is my ServiceNow workspace, all pulled into, in this case, an OpenShift developer environment. So you may have to install some of the extensions out of the box. It will you know, do a JavaScript debugger, but if you need to add in the Ansible extension, which obviously I would highly recommend, you can just do a quick search in the Ansible extension install and that should be it i would modify it once it's installed to make sure that if there are an execution environment by default you do not need it because the one thing that i specifically called out before was since i'm in the ee this terminal is actually running in the execution environment itself i do not need to have an execution environment enabled so i can still have everything else from the fully qualified collection names to ansible lint and all that set i can't use ansible lightspeed because this is not a laptop installed VS Code, but all the other capabilities of VS Code do work properly. So to prove that that exists, I'm going to open up a role that I have in here. I'll just open up a random task, and you'll see that it's gonna go through the process of activating the extensions. There are a few prompts that always show up, but it's actually already completed Ansible Lint. I can see that I'm running Ansible 2.15.5 on Python 3.9.18, and the syntax highlighting already worked for my servicenow.itsm.incident collection. To prove that this does have my execution environment and it even has my custom collections, I can create a new task and just add in, um, add in Shadow Man report, because I have a Shadow Man report collection that exists. And if I type in report, it will show up that the Shadow Man or an Info Net repository. So my Shadow Man Net Report WinScan packages module that exists is available here. So this is how I can verify that this is exact my execution environment, not a random out of the box execution environment exists. So I can use this and just like I can in the normal VS Code, I can right click and click run Ansible Playbook via, I would run this via Ansible Playbook because that's gonna be the easiest process. So just to show the capability of this, I will create a new file just called Hello World. Since I don't have a host file or anything like that set up, it can be as simple as just creating a hello world playbook. And you'll see that this will still run in the command prompt here with the colorization that I want because again, I like I have a nice simple command prompt. But you'll still see that all the syntax highlighting is working, all the autocomplete is working, all the suggestions are working. So it gives me that capability as I'm going through with Ansible Lint during the process. Now this is saved, I'll verify that this lint's properly, and I can just right click, run Ansible Playbook via, run Playbook via Ansible Playbook. It's gonna open up a terminal window, run it, and there you go. So I could open up multiple projects just as simple by going back to the OpenShift Dev Spaces console, creating a new workspace to a different repository that has that dev file.yaml, and that's it. So I could have four, five, six, seven, eight different workspaces, all pointing to that same modified execution environment, but all give me that capability to run with my execution environment, my collections in this environment. So it can significantly speed up some of your development processes. So I'll include below a link to my Ansible development repository. That's where I have the container file as well as the bash RC and shells file. Also includes the dev file.yaml if you need an example of what that looks like. Those are really the only steps that I needed to modify in order to make a working OpenShift Dev Spaces development environment. 
So if you have OpenShift dev spaces or if you've got a Red Hat developer subscription, I highly encourage you to try this out. It was surprisingly quick and easy to spin up once I figured out the necessary permissions for Ansible Lint to work properly, but this can significantly improve the onboarding process for some of your Ansible developers. So thank you for taking the time out to learn a little bit more about how I can use OpenShift dev spaces to create an Ansible development environment. Please let me know if you have any questions. Click my picture on the right to subscribe or click the image on the left to watch another video.